Absolutely. So, close. Put this away. That's it. Okay, cool. All right. So we're going to go live here. WDNYK Studios. No children or animals were harmed in the production of this podcast. people. Well, uh, welcome to Unbreaking Science. I'm your host, Dr. James Lyons Weiler. We're coming to you live from the WWDNYK studios. And today we have a very special guest of Ashley Dodd, and I'm very happy to introduce her. We're going to do a little brief uh, Unbreaking Science today. Uh, so please uh, w welcome Ashley. Thank you. I appreciate you having me today. You're coming from Chicago? Chicago area, yes. Right on. So how are things there in Illinois with respect to vaccine risk awareness and exemptions? Well, we have a large group that is uh, vaccine risk aware. Um, right now we have a couple of table bills that we're watching and, and um, trying to get our advocates trained and ready uh, so that if something should happen that we're ready to fight those bills. Okay, cool. So um, how, how keen are your and how responsive are your legislators there to to science, to the reality of the lack of safety science and what uh, the CDC has done to science. Yeah, well, I think it depends on the legislator and it seems to be a party issue for us in Illinois. Um, I think that our legislators, like anybody, it depends on the approach that you take with them when mm -hmm. you're speaking to the science and you're speaking to the corruption, all of those things. Um, right now, we're still navigating some of those waters as far as knowing who our allies are and who um, is open to hearing from us and sure. those who n might not be. Yeah, right on. So we, we just got news today that New Brunswick, that the mandatory vaccination bill that was going to go in without exemptions is now dead. And I went there to educate the legislators on the state of the science. And, you know, I'm, I'm in a funny place because um, I, do an, I run a not-for-profit. And in running the not-for-profit, I have access to all the science that the legislators should know, but I'm technically not supposed to lobby. And so I don't lobby. I don't tell them what my position is. I don't let them know, you know, overtly what, I, what my position is. I just let them draw their own conclusions about what my, what my position, if they care to. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm confident that the, the, what we experienced in New Brunswick with respect to telling them that the science that they're being told is there is not there is an extremely powerful message. And I'm also confident that uh, the message that you might want vaccines for everyone, but unfortunately they are just not for everyone. And there are some people that have had to learn through hard one experience that it's not for them or their family. And do you have vaccine injured people in your family? Um, or do you care not to talk about it? No, no, I do. Um, of my five kiddos, my first three uh, were vaccinated. Um, my son, my second son, he at three months had his DTAC vaccine and started the high pitch screaming, arching back, mm. digestive issues. Um, I tend to more speak with the science during the uh, during legislative meetings because I get really choked up about uh, my son. Yeah. But um, he has been diagnosed with a traumatic brain injury profound dyslexia. Dyslexia is on a spectrum, sort of like autism. Yeah. Um, so he's profoundly dyslexic, uh, anxiety disorder, um, ADHD. I don't like to put my kiddos in a box, but at the same time, if I, um, you know, use those labels, you guys understand what he deals with on a daily basis. Well, these labels like, uh, you know, a, a brain disorder, these, these brain, um, uh, oh, sorry, these brain dysfunctions that happened, like uh, autism spectrum disorder, it's called a disorder by the DSM. I have a copy. Hang on. 
I have a copy of the DSM here. It's called an autism spectrum disorder. That is a clinical term. So when we say that somebody has brain damage, that's vernacular for a disorder, uh, the court's National Vaccine Injury Compensation Program prefers the term um, uh, encephalopathy, which means there's something wrong with your head. Mm -hmm. Right? We have this encephalon on top of our body that's called a head, and pathy means there's something wrong with it. Right. So the, the, the identity politics doesn't really play a role in making kids better. Right. Right? It, 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 might, it might confuse parents to say, well, there's nothing wrong with your child, they're perfectly normal, and autism is the new normal. And it might confuse parents into thinking that there's nothing that medically could be done. I think it's a grave disservice for Amazon to block books and not, and not sell books that talk about how to reduce the severity of symptoms of autism. So identity politics is a great thing to talk about, but we're on a short time here. We've got a hard stop at the end because you're busy and I'm busy. But um, I want to talk with you about, um, you know, why you're here. Well, first of all, I want to say I'm sorry that about, about the vaccine injury in your family. On behalf of all the professionals and all of the rest of society who will one day understand the heroes that these families really are for alerting the rest of humanity about what vaccines can do, um, I want to say that I'm sorry that your family suffered that and that you suffered that. And that, I cut, that comes from the heart. Uh, but I want to talk with you about um, why you're here in Pittsburgh. Uh, a lot of people know why you're here in Pittsburgh today and tomorrow, but I want you to start from the stop, from the top about your, your program that you're running. Sure. So I'm here in Pittsburgh to do an advocacy training. Um, I found, I like to always witness and take a step back and look at the situation before I start engaging. And when I did that, I noticed that a lot of people wanted to get involved. They wanted to speak with legislators. They wanted to be an advocate, but they really didn't know how to navigate those waters. And so I figured if I could put together a training or a course to teach people um, that they would be not only um, better equipped, but more empowered and inspired to take action. I was really lucky that I had some amazing mentors who guided me and who helped me. Um, I got fast tracked really quickly mm -hmm. by these mentors taking the time. Um, and I'm not kidding when I said I've probably had hundreds of, of hours worth of effort put into where we're at now Absolutely. as far as um, in my journey. So I figured if I could then do that for other people, and I feel a responsibility to do that too since so many people invested in me, if I could go around and do the same, then we could um, hopefully keep growing our, our community, growing our advocates, and really make the effective change um, on our parts that needs to happen. So to, to, to help uh, parents who might not be um, totally comfortable talking with their legislators, you have a training program. Okay. that you're, Is this the first time you're running it here in Pittsburgh? Or this is the first time in Pittsburgh. Um, I've had several different areas in Illinois, probably trains close to 80 people in Illinois. Um, it is an intense training. It can be anywhere from two to four hours long, depending on the content we cover. I try to give the content towards the needs of the individual group and where people are at. I think it's really important to meet people where they're at. Not everybody's comfortable meeting with legislators, and that's okay. Sometimes they just want to write a letter. Right. So I'm going to teach them how to write the most effective letter. Nice. So that's really what it's about is effective advocacy. I mean, I don't think any of, the, any of us do this for fun. I'm sure there's a lot of other things we could do. So making the most effective use out of the time and the strategies and the tactics that we have to make the biggest impact is the goal here. Mm -hmm. um, so so the other, other parents might be more comfortable actually meeting with legislators. And if they do it, I'm sure you have advice on things that might be effective and things that might not be effective. So absolutely. in the interest of time, let's talk about things that might not be effective in your opinion. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, things that are not effective are definitely going in aggressive. I think that you know, given the circumstances, it's completely understandable um, to be upset yeah. with what's happening to our community, with what's happening to our own kiddos, with what's happening to other children in our community. Um, unfortunately, though, when we go in angry or we go in with that fear-based mentality of um, like them taking our religious exemptions from us or things like that, and we live in that, that frequency of fear, we're kind of met with that. And when we go in aggressive, 
we can't make the proper arguments that we need to make. So let me talk scientifically about why people become aggressive. People become aggressive when they're conflicted in their brain. You know, you have your message that you're, it's not a performance, right? That would be something that we'd need to talk about. Absolutely. You're not performing, you're yeah. relating. And there's a difference between performing. Well, I'm not comfortable speaking in front of people. You're concerned, you're focused on the performance aspect of what you're doing, but you should be focusing on making a relationship human and connection. right Very making it making a human connection and so if if you put away the f stage fright basically right. what it is and recognize that this is a human being they have a family they grew up in the same state exactly. focus on the commonalities right exactly. and go in and see them as human beings first even if it doesn't go well Right. You've planted a seed of your personality that you also have to have, that you're a, 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 an authentic person right. and that you're not a crazy, you know, cra just a, you're not just a crazy mom. Right. 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 And that is important. And I think that's one thing that we do forget is, um, especially nowadays, social media, I mean, loneliness, right? That's only increasing. We don't have those human connections. And when we meet somebody there, I think that that's when change really can happen. And people, you know, they don't have to agree with us to protect our rights, That's right. right? They don't have to agree with us on the vaccine issue to understand how it would affect their district as far as maybe how many, how much money they get for funding their schools or constitutional rights or all of those things. Right. Beliefs are very, like, it's very hard to change somebody's beliefs. And so when we go in there expecting them to share similar beliefs or we're going in there just because we're right, I think sometimes that's where it doesn't always work out they're yeah, well, they, 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 they're they going to get defensive if you treat them like they're, they are they should know everything that you know. Exactly. And they're going to get defensive if they if you treat them like they should be an expert in vaccine science. They, they're not experts in vaccine no. science. It took a lot for me as a lifelong scientist to wake up to the fact. It took a lot for me to wake up right. to the fact that there was fraud going on, that there was uh, shortcuts that were being taken, mm -hmm. that they were relying on small studies that are underpowered that, that uh, they corrected for covariates that were related to outcomes. This is very technical stuff. You, you know, your run-of-the-bill neighbor that happens to be a representative, okay, is not going to know. And if you think that they should know, well, no, maybe your job isn't even to educate them about that, but rather to say the consequences of whatever happened right. are increased anxiety, increased suicide rates in teens. You know, nobody has an explanation for all these weird things like pandas and pot and pots and nobody they, they can attribute some of it sometimes but you know uh uh and 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 the, the concern over the well-being of children is shared right so do you tell them to focus on the shared concern over well-being of children yeah absolutely i mean one of the main goals is to find common ground at first yeah. because part of the re reason of meeting with legislators and trying to build that relationship at first is trying to find somebody who um is with us I guess, um, can champion our efforts who at least understands where we're coming from. Yeah. Um, and then obviously for those who don't, you know, there are different strategies to um, maybe get somebody in there who is more prone to, to hearing us. I love that. But I... I also think too, you know, we have to realize there's no way that I can, I've been vaccine risk aware for 10 years. There's no way that I can um, give 10 years worth of information that I know to somebody in a 30 minute meeting. That's right. And if I try to do that, then that message is going to be lost because they don't understand the same level. Um, and I think we have to realize too, that their reality gets taken down when we start talking about vaccine injury and we start talking about the corruption and, you know, there's something called the backfire effect where, <laughs> You know, sometimes when we all we want, if all we want to do is present facts and facts and facts, that they actually um, step back further in their own beliefs and in their own stance. <laughs> and so, through the advocacy training, I teach people how to bypass that mm -hmm. um, and to create that open dialogue. Now, by by me saying relationships with legislators, I'm not saying you know you guys are buddy buddy and friends. Right. There definitely is a line drawn, um, knowing who to support, who not to support knowing when you don't have influence and maybe other strategies and other campaigns need to be implemented. Um, so I have a question for you sure. uh, that would be, I think, very topical for many groups around the country that are struggling with the threats over religious, uh, stripping the rights for religious mm -hmm. exemption, what I call stripping the rights to practice religion as you see fit, right. uh, uh, as well as uh, personal exemptions. Um, what advice do you have for groups where the strategies for how to approach 
legislators or legislature, uh, the legislature differs within a group where one person believes that you should be aggressive. Another person believes, no, we're trying to build relationships. Another person believes something else. And they kind of take it personally among the group as a power struggle within the group over, well, you're not listening to me. You're not taking my advice. You need to consider what, I, what my strategy is and your strategy. Because I've seen a lot of, of groups split, actually. And it's sad because they're very, very tight friends. They're bonded over the, vac the shared commonality of vaccine injury in their family or just the fear of vaccine injury can bond people. Uh, and then they splinter and there can be animosity among individuals uh, that can be you know, reinforced with uh, other distancing emotional experiences. But you know, what advice do you have for a group? Um, I wanna know what you have to say about that. Yeah, so I've actually had some experience in this think that it's really important to remember that we all have different goals. We all have different strategies. We all have different strengths and weaknesses. Yeah. Now, ideally, um, we would work together and we would balance out each other's strengths and weaknesses. But when that doesn't happen, I think it's really important to just, you do you. You do what you feel is right with your strategy. Yeah. We talk about in the advocacy training about how important it is to always stay civil with people, regardless of whether you agree with their tactic or not. Yeah. Um, the reality is, is that there is going to be some conflict and we're not going to always agree on everything, but we are in this together and we are in this movement together. And at the end of the day, what, you know, what's your why, right? Why are we doing this? Because there are people in this movement who don't get to wake up to their kids anymore. Yeah, that's there exactly are people right. who don't get to have homecomings and who don't get to hear their kids' voices. And so, you know, it that's why that's why we're fighting. That's, right, that's right. Why. And, I mean, and, and right. both both sides in in an argument within a group would say, Well, that's why I'm here and you Absolutely. know that's why that's why it's so important to me that we do it my way. Yeah. Right. And so they become kind of entrenched and they take it personally. Well when I've dealt with groups that have gone through this and the groups I'm not talking about any specific group or any specific person, so please understand I get calls and emails and I get called into group, you know, conference calls on a regular basis over this very issue for some reason. People treat me like I'm Uncle Jack or something. <laughs> and I don't mind doing it, don't get me wrong. But the first thing I try to tell them is is what I told my nephew when he and his his wife were having difficulties. Do you do you guys think that you invented these issues between men and women? Are you the first people to feel jealousy because she talked to another guy? This is ridiculous. The human beings have been on the planet for at least four million years or so, mod anatomically modern humans, the last 50,000, maybe 100,000 years. And, and every generation and every couple, there's the possibility of a replication of that issue. And, and, and so much so that, you know, we see it replicated through different groups. It's just a small group dynamic. Right. Don't take it personally. And then when it comes to my message on legislative flu, I don't know if you ever caught that, but my message on legislative mm -hmm. flu is that you can be controlled opposition and not know it. Right. Controlled opposition means that you are under the influence of a legislator whose job it is to keep keep things down to a dull roar. Right, because that's what they want. They want to keep the status quo and they, you know, obviously, if, I watched the last podcast when you were talking about that and yeah. one person would kind of be the point person right. to handle the group community and their strategies around that as well. Okay, cool. So you talk about that. Actually. I do, because right. it's, it happens a lot, actually. It can happen with professional lobbyists even. So yeah, that's something that we definitely need to be aware of and, and learn to spot it and then work around it when it happens. Very cool. Sounds like you're really on top of everything, Ashley. I'm really excited. Um, so uh, I'll be talking tomorrow at, at the event. I won't be talking about these strategies. I'll be learning along with everybody, but I'll be definitely uh, talking about science. I'll be talking about aluminum. I'll be talking about our second manuscript on aluminum, and I'm going to go in, as Diana requested, into what we're doing with the Baxton Vax study and where that is. Um, and so do you have any seats left or are you sold out? I, you'd have to ask Diana. We have, we have a few seats left. Apparently we have a few seats left. Uh, Diana, why don't you join the podcast for a second? Come on in and sit down. Everyone, this is Diana Campbell. Bingo. Hey. <laughs> right. So tell us where it is, uh, where they can still get tickets. Is it in the Pittsburgh area, Allison Park? Yeah. Allison Park, Pennsylvania. It's at the Nutra Pharmacy in Allison Park. Um, you got to be on that uh, mic. There we go. There, you go. there we go. Um, yes, it's in Allison Park, Pennsylvania. 
It's at the Nutra Pharmacy. We can put um, links in. Um, and you can get tickets at Eventbrite. We really, we only have a couple more spots. Uh, <clears throat> we had um, lunch donated. It's being catered by a, a donor. Bought lunch for everybody. Um, we, and we had Dr. Weiler talking and Ashley's training. And then... Um, <clears throat> what? Where, where do they, they get, get the tickets? tickets? Um, event. See. The event is at 2506 Wildwood Road, Allison Park, PA, 15101 at the Nutra Pharmacy. But to sign up for the tickets, where do they sign up? And how many do you have left? I only have four tickets left. Four tickets So left. we did good. Cool. Um, did we did really good. well. Um, it's going to be a pretty packed room. I mean, I'll sit on the floor. I mean, if five people want to come, <laughs> I have no problem. I'll sit on the floor. Um, I feel really good about the content that's being shared tomorrow. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's one of those weird links, like Eventbrite links. It's, it's an Eventbrite, Eventbrite link. They can find your you on Facebook, right, for it? Yes. It's a public post on my Facebook page. Um, sorry. This is such an exciting just, podcast. Isn't you it so exciting? Phone. I'm totally phone. on top of it. Right. So <laughs> let me do a little thing while you do some homework there. Okay. Um, uh, so, uh, let's see, uh, Wildwood Road is right off of Route 8 in, Pencil in, in Pennsylvania, uh, in, north of Pittsburgh. It's right off of Route 8 coming out of the city. Um, you're going to come up into, uh, up through Aetna and, uh, through Glenshaw, and then you're going to come into the Hampton area, which is right near my house. It's about five minutes away from my house. Um, the important point of this event um because you want to cover a little bit over what what we're going to cover yeah absolutely let's do that okay so we're going to talk about the three different types of advocacy we're going to talk about community advocacy social media advocacy and then legislative advocacy because there are different tools and tactics to engage in those different forms and like i mentioned earlier not everybody wants to engage in the same form of advocacy um social media is an incredible tool um websites are an incredible tool um, we built out ChristopherBunch.org. We're getting a lot of traffic there. We oh, that's there. your product. So I created the awareness strategy and built out the user flow and oh, designed the website. We've gotten over 30,000 views in the last two and a half, um, or visitors, not views. 30,000 okay. visitors in the last two and a half months. Wow. Um, so, I mean, that's pretty impressive. To put it in context, a new website would probably only get, they'd be lucky to get a couple hundred in a month. Yeah. So 30,000 significant in over 3,000 different cities, 70 different countries. So we talk about those strategies. Um, we talk about tactics and goals. We talk mm -hmm. about strategies. I get down to actually how to write an effective letter or what you even say when you're calling your staff person trying to get a meeting. Yeah. So wherever you are in your journey, there's something for you. Whether you are ready to dive in 100%, you have the, the blueprint. Or if you're just coming to maybe get your toes a little wet and see like where where you can jump in, there's going to be all sorts of different um, resources for that. So like Absolutely. I said, whether you want to write a letter, how to talk to your legislator, how to formulate talking points. So like when you talk about the science, how do we formulate those into talking points when we're speaking with legislators? Right. Right. So if I say microglial activation to a legislator who right. you know has never heard the word neural, you know, immunoneuroexcitotoxicity. Right. Um, we're, we're in deep trouble. Yeah. <laughs> we don't want to do that. So we got to bring it down to yeah, about eighth grade level, but you know, there's ways to do that, but you know, I also want to do it without condescension. So, um, all right. So we're, we're coming up against our, our hard stop here. So the last word, I'll give it to you for where they can go. Did you figure it out? Yeah. I posted a link in the comments. Oh, on this podcast? On, on your podcast. All right, cool, cool. So check the links in the comments. You're wonderful. Thank you. You're both wonderful. Look at these lovely ladies that I get to hang out with. This is the best part of my job to spend time with people. And uh, I, uh, Dr. James Lyons Weiler from Unbreaking Science coming to you from the WWDNYK studios. Uh, we're going to close out with No Kami's, uh sound bug. This is her song, Unbreaking Science. It's quite an honor to have an artist make a song, a rap song of all things, and uh, check it out, check her out on SoundCloud, I believe, uh, Nokomis, N-O-K-O-M-I-S, 
IS. She says that the revenue from the sales of the song are going to go to fund IPAC, which actually, make sure that you check out the IPAC website, ipaknowledge.org, for your monthly donation, for your monthly support, or you can support this podcast on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash WWDNYK. We're out. Dr. James Lyon Tyler, a.k.a. Dr. Jack. In this episode, we're going to be reading the evidence. I didn't kill the audio here. It's okay. You guys are cute. It can sit on my lap. That's fine. It's okay. It's all right. We're good. Cool. Thanks, Jack. Yeah, I hope that helps. No, it was so go. good. It was really good. Awesome. You should work under pressure more, Jack. You did a little better. No, I'm just kidding. It's <laughs> so long <laughs> setting this damn thing up. This, we might be going live through a mic. I don't know. I spent so long trying to get this thing to work this morning. Uh, I'm glad I made it look easy. Right? It's like, I knew. What the hell's going on? <laughs> Anyway, uh, <laughs> yeah, we'll this. I um, turned my podcast on this morning, um, and my son was like, play it again, Mom, play it again. Aww. He loves that. Well, he likes the song. Is he a song too? No, he just likes the song. I'm I saying he wanted it. that song. Oh, cool. Yeah, he loves it. The rap <laughs> song. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> we have to come up with a dance for it, so like a line dance. Oh, my gosh. And somebody, we were having the choreogra- choreographs. Uh, mm-hmm. in choreographers in our movement to uh, I'm sure we do. To take the music and make a line. So when we all get together, we do karaoke, we play this thing. That'd be so funny oh if it took off. Thank you so much. You're welcome. For being on the show. You're very, very welcome. Thank you for all you're doing. You're, I know. Yeah. You're making a big difference. Um, you know, where we end up, I don't know, but I, I don't know where you're going to end up in the long run, but I know that they're, we're not going to make it easy. For them to do to us what they did on that show, and and they've they've done elsewhere. Well, we were actually talking about that and like how to tackle and how to not how to get where they are. And I watch all three captains all the time, so I know how you can. It's not an easy fix either. It's, it's just a long term strategy. So in Pennsylvania, 